a master forger's ingenious crime spanned three continents. The reach of this scheme seeped its way into the international art market. Masquerading as a respected dealer, he conned the art world's elite. He played this risky, high-stakes game right under everyone's noses. The scheme was brilliant, really. The experts had as good a fake done, period. He made millions and millions and millions of dollars. He was truly a mastermind. In the early 1990s, the Japanese became fascinated with French Impressionist art. There was a lot of people flush with money, and they really wanted to show off to their friends. And the way that you do that was to have uh, a painting by one of the modern masters. But the thrill of owning a masterpiece soon turned into a nightmare for some collectors. The people in Tokyo would open up the New York Christie's or Sotheby's auction catalog for that spring and discovered that a painting that they thought they owned was up for sale. A buyer would come forward and say, just a second now, I saw that you had a work announced in your catalog, but I was the purchaser of that work and I still own it. There must be something wrong. And they said, well, we have to get this resolved. One of these is not real. And so they immediately shipped the paintings overseas to have them checked. There are procedures that are in place that specialists use to make sure that a work is by the artist that it's purported to be. In every case, it was determined that the paintings owned by the Japanese collectors were forgeries. These fakes were good enough to fool major specialists and auction houses and dealers and collectors. There's no question about that. The Japanese owners were horrified to discover that their paintings were now worthless. You feel burned, you know, they're burned and bitter, let alone out of the money if you can't get your money back. Called in to investigate, the New York FBI consulted an expert to track down the forger. The expert said, it's probably someone in China. China is known for having unbelievably good quality you know, oil painters. Faking and copying is a very ancient tradition in China. It's not considered the same way it is here. But finding the forger in a country of 1.3 billion proved impossible. So the FBI began investigating the ownership history of each painting. Paintings are bought and sold. It's a very tedious process following the trail. The investigation took us to Taiwan, France, Switzerland, England. But the chain of ownership always came to a dead end in Japan. Over in Tokyo, you had a lot of very humiliated dealers who did not necessarily want to talk. The Japanese culture says saving face is very, very important. The people who are deceived don't want to make it public. I think they feel embarrassed, particularly if they're people who should have known better, who were sophisticated collectors. Owners also kept silent because they knew what would happen if they were caught with a fake. When authorities get a fake painting on their hands, it's not to be celebrated or to be studied. They destroyed it because that's the way they operate. With investigators unable to stop the forgeries, the crime spree continued to escalate. They were on the order of 200 of these fake and forged modern and impressionist paintings in the marketplace. In the art world, because we deal with large sums of money, these major frauds make headline news. The FBI suspected an international crime syndicate, but the mastermind behind the greatest forgery scheme in U.S. history was a respected New York art dealer who fooled experts worldwide and made himself millions. Ali Sakai's family arrived in New York from Iran in the early 1960s and opened a small art gallery in Manhattan. He is from a family that has a long history in the arts, so it's clearly a very creative, very artistic family. His brothers are involved in antiques, particularly Persian antiques, a lot of clocks, a lot of paintings. 
Sakai himself came by his artistic pedigree pretty, you know, pretty honestly because he, you know, he definitely knew a fair amount about the arts. But working for his older brothers isn't the life he hopes for. Sakai wants to make millions, so he sets out and opens his own store. He was the sole owner of exclusive art, selling art, antiquities, furniture. It was heaped with items, one on top of another, cluttered and dusty. The paintings hidden under furniture and behind lamps and vases and everything else. I would say rather unappealing and unattractive. Knowing he'll need higher-end merchandise to be treated as a legitimate dealer, Sakai starts attending art auctions. Well, the New York art community is pretty tightly knit. Everyone knows everyone else. When Sakai first showed up on the scene, he was kind of a weird figure because he had this Clark Gable pencil line mustache. He'd be wearing like a, a, like a, a purple suit or these cowboy boots with a fringe jacket. It didn't quite mesh. They couldn't quite figure out what message he was trying to send. Are you kidding, sir? Leaving the auction house empty-handed, Sakai realizes he doesn't fit into this elite world. Desperate to make his mark, he finally sees an opportunity when he notices one of his genuine Tiffany lamps looks identical to a reproduction. The only difference is the certificate of authenticity and label. As a matter of practice, Tiffany was putting some kind of label on the base, Tiffany Studios. In spite of the risk, Sakai transforms his reproduction by creating and affixing a fake label to its base. He copied the original certificate of authenticity that had been issued for the authentic work. He then sells numerous fakes to unsuspecting collectors, making hundreds of thousands of dollars. The scheme of selling the fake as if it were the authentic work was brilliant, really. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Flush with cash, Sakai starts dating a well-connected Japanese woman. He does speak some Japanese. Um, he's uh, proficient able to get by in Japanese. He now reinvents himself as a successful art dealer. He began to adopt a much more conservative way of dressing. He would just wear very, very wonderful, expensive suits. You could tell just by his deportment that he was worth a lot of money. After getting married, Sakai's wife takes him to Japan, where she teaches him about the Asian art world. The Japanese are madly in love with late 19th century and early 20th century Impressionist and post-Impressionist works. It's here that Sakai learns the importance placed on certificates of authenticity by Japanese buyers. They don't have very good access to art experts in Japan, so when they buy a painting, they want to make sure it's the real thing. For the first time, Sakai sees a way to make himself millions. He's going to exploit the Japanese market. The reason why Sakai targeted Tokyo is that if someone buys a fake and discovers it's a fake, they're actually going to feel very embarrassed about it. They're going to feel very ashamed, so they're not going to want to raise a stink about it. He now returns to New York and invests every dollar he has to purchase 13 paintings. The artists he was interested in were mainly 19th and early 20th century. You know, Gauguin, Chagall, Renoir, Modiani, etc. He didn't necessarily deal with their top-end paintings, so not necessarily their most expensive works. The range generally was somewhere in the order of between 50000 and two hundred fifty to $500,000. These are sort of mid-range modern and impressionist paintings. That was a very smart move because those paintings did not get the scrutiny that a five or ten million dollar painting would get. So it flies a little under the radar. Mr. Sakai now took a number of steps to make the forgeries look like they were actually created in the time period when that artist lived. He bought paintings that really had no value at all other than the fact that the frame was very old. Because when you do a forgery, you have to have the artifact look old. He now attaches a blank canvas to the old frame using antique nails. He developed 
certain mechanisms for aging or making the works appear to be more aged from coating the surfaces with various materials to adding tea stains. With the canvases ready, he begins recruiting the perfect forgers. The artists that Eli Sakai retained to create the copies were people coming from China, recent immigrants to the United States. These individuals were professionally trained artists. They all received formal training in oil painting, and part of that training involved copying masters. To keep his forgers on a tight rein, Sakai sets them up in a studio above his store. He hired artists who needed money, less sophisticated with American ways, more willing not to ask too many questions. He immediately puts his artists to work instructing them to copy the original paintings exactly. What was so clever in Sakai's scheme is that he in fact did own the authentic work. If the fakes were based simply on photographs, you're always likely to trip yourself up. You can do a much better fake if you have the original in your hand. You can see exactly what the brush strokes are like. You can see exactly how some of the colors might have faded. He instructed the fakers to copy all the little markings, all the little details. So if there was a scratch on a painting on the lower left side, that scratch was replicated in the fake. With the fronts of the paintings finished, Sakai himself now sets to work. The backs were created to be identical, meaning that if there had been a crayon marking on the back, that crayon marking was reproduced on the forgery. Sakai then adds one final touch. He would take the certificate of authenticity off a real painting and attach it to the fake. The genius of Sakai's plan is that he had the original painting. He could always get another certificate for the original because it was the real thing. So he actually nailed all three or four things you need to produce a really compelling fake. After months of preparation, Sakai is finally ready to strike. He and his wife fly to Tokyo. I think the Japanese market was a convenient and safe place for him to place these paintings. In effect, it was the other side of the world. Sakai set himself up in one of these hotels and entertained guests all week long. Some of them would be art experts, art dealers, art buyers. He cons prospective customers by showing them the Sotheby's catalog, where he bought the authentic painting. Think how clever it is. You're selling a fake to someone, but you can open an auction catalog and show the record of the sales, which he, he himself had purchased at auction. How brilliant, really. To seal the deal, Sakai then shows the interested buyer the certificate of authenticity. He sells all 13 forgeries and makes over $4 million. These were works that were going for a few hundred thousand dollars. Poor people don't buy art for four hundred thousand dollars so he made quite a nice profit mr sakai made millions and millions and millions of dollars in this scheme he was cocky he couldn't see the danger he, he thought i'm invulnerable and i could get away with this forever ali sakai is now living the life of a respected dealer and multi-millionaire but his forgeries will soon paint him in a very different light After making millions selling his first set of forgeries, Ali Sakai goes on a spree. He buys dozens of original paintings in New York, forges them, then sells them all in Japan. There were some people who purchased works over and over from Sakai. So he had an established network of clients. With his scheme up and running, Sakai now decides to risk selling his genuine paintings thousands of miles away in New York. Sakai was a patient guy, and he would wait three or four years before he put it all up for auction. Um, he wanted to make sure, even though he, he, was, he was keeping New York and Tokyo separate, he wanted to make sure that the coast was clear. But before selling the original paintings, he replaces the certificates of authenticity. The genius of Sakai's plan is that he had the original painting, he could send it back to Europe and say, I'm sorry, I lost the certificate, can I get a new one? The authenticating body would do whatever investigation they did, and the end result would be that Mr. Sakai would obtain the certificate of authenticity. 
Armed with the new certificates, Sakai sells the genuine paintings, making a massive profit on his initial purchase. Sold. He was a fixture at Christie's and Sotheby's. People saw him regularly there. Sakai is actually a, a pretty well-known and, and pretty well-respected guy. Using his millions, Sakai now buys a mansion in Long Island and opens the high-end gallery he's always dreamed of. He was very well known in his Iranian Jewish community on Long Island as a very big fundraiser and donor to the community. He actually paid to create a Torah center, the Ellie Sakai uh, Torah Center. This guy looks like a pillar of the community, you know? I mean, he put, put a lot of money into that community. But his new lifestyle comes at a cost. He's forced to ramp up production by hiring more forgers. Now there were at least a 10 artists and maybe more who were involved in this scheme. Sakai also instructs his artists to paint multiple copies of each painting. When you're greedy enough to now want to double dip and have more than one fake, you expose yourself to an element of risk. In May 2000, I guess you can say the inevitable happened. An expert at Christie's recognizes Paul Gauguin's Va de Fleur in Sotheby's catalog. Christie's and Sotheby's were selling what was apparently the identical work. There was an inspection, an examination of both paintings side by side by Sotheby's and Christie's. And it was determined that the Christie's version was fake and the Sotheby's version was correct. I was told by one of the experts that um, she had never seen such a good fake done uh, of Buster Flourish. In fact, she'd, she'd never seen a, as good a fake done, period. When the FBI is called in, they trace the genuine painting back to Ellie Sakai, who had purchased it five years earlier. But the fake proves harder for the FBI to trace. You had interviews with basically the chain of custody for that painting to locate the first victim of the forgery. The collector tells authorities the last thing they expect to hear. The victim from Japan said she bought a forgery from Mr. Sakai. For the first time, both an original and its copy link back to Ellie Sakai. Investigators now seize Sakai's business records. We would identify Mr. Sakai's purchase of the original painting, obtain documents for his sale of the fake to one of his victims. The process of investigating this case uh, was very long and painstaking. The paper trail eventually leads the FBI back to Sakai's Japanese clients. One victim we identified in the course of our investigation purchased somewhere on the order of 17 paintings from Mr. Sakai. We believe all to be forgeries. Armed with this information, the FBI returns to New York and prepares to paint Ali Sakai into a corner. One of the first things I did was to do some surveillances and to identify the artists coming and going from all his galleries. Jim Wynn was able to identify, locate, and speak to many of the artists that had actually created the forgeries. Well, there's no federal violation about creating a copy of a painting. The violation comes in in the sale of that fake and representing it as an authentic work. When the FBI leans on the forgers, they admit to painting the copies requested by Sakai. They also offer the FBI photos documenting their work. To me, this was the most significant event in the history of the case because we now had Mr. Sakai commissioning, ordering, orchestrating the entire scheme. On March 9th, 2004, I, along with other agents, went to Mr. Sakai's gallery on Broadway in Manhattan, and he was there, and he was placed under arrest. Sakai pleads guilty to fraud and is sentenced to 41 months in prison. Mr. Sakai agreed to make $12.5 million in cash restitution and agreed to forfeit 11 paintings valued anywhere between $800 and $1 million. The reach of this scheme seeped its way and pervaded the international art market. It's impossible to know 
where all the forgeries are. There could well be forged versions in collections or in stores or in museums right now. I'm going to continue to get telephone calls from now till forever about forgeries that are appearing for sale. So this will be a long, never-ending process. You couldn't help but be fascinated by a guy who played this risky, high-stakes game right under everyone's noses. He really thought that no one would ever be able to stick this to him. This has been the most fascinating scheme that I've ever seen, and it's been the most successful scheme. I must say, he was truly a mastermind. Oh, <laughs> no.